Hi there. Five years ago, an American family purchased an unknown drawing by Albrecht Dürer for only $30. They thought it was a replica, but it turned out to be a five-century-old masterpiece that is estimated to be worth up to $50 million. The rediscovery of the Virgin and the Child with Flowers in the Grassy Bank was made by a shareholder of Agnews Gallery. Now, as part of London Art Week, the gallery has put the artwork on display. And in this way, the event realizes one of its biggest goals, bringing hidden works of art to the public. Let's speak to Alexandra Toscano. She's an advisory board member of London Art Week. Hi there, it's good to have you with us today. Thanks so much. We just said that one of the biggest goals of the event is bringing hidden works of art to the public. Tell us what else you are aiming with the event. Why is this event being held? The event is, has, has been going for, for 20 years. It was originally an idea to join with old master drawings dealers in London to create a sense that you could come and visit art dealers, that we weren't just uh, rather snooty, uh, exclusive uh, people. You can actually come and knock on our doors and ring our bells and come up for one week of the year, that's how it started, and get to know the art dealer and the marvellous collections that they have, things that they have to sell, and their knowledge, which is very, very important. And this event grew, and the paintings dealers in St James's and Mayfair and the sculpture dealers too wanted to join in. And so we, we joined the whole event and made it London Art Week, which is a bit of a misnomer because it's not actually just one week. It is during the week in the, of the sales in July in London, and there's a week in December. But we have an online platform and scholarly and academic talks throughout the year. And why do you think it is important for the public to get to know art dealers and uh, you know, break the understanding that uh, art dealers are not really approachable? Well, it's, it's something that, we, it, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We did it ourselves, to ourselves. Art dealers are a very, very important part of the, of the system. There are many, many ways to buy art. You have auction houses, which perform a wonderful function, and indeed they're part of London Art Week. And you have art fairs, which is a different experience. But art dealers are very knowledgeable. They uh, live and die by their own decisions. It's their money. They, they have an expertise in their field. And often they're not very good at transmitting all the things that they know. They have a wonderful relationship with museum curators and the knowledge of, of, of the art that they buy, that they buy with their own pocket, um, is huge. And what we wanted to do was to make that knowledge accessible to anybody who was really interested in art. Collecting art is, is, is a passionate uh, thing to do and you have to start somewhere. Um, and Often you won't be able to afford a number of the things that are on uh, on sale at the top dealers in Mayfair and St James's. But if you get to know what they have on offer and can learn a little bit about what field that you're interested in, and there's so much information there, then you can maybe start something that you really love doing for yourself. So is London Art Week only for people who want to start collecting art or what is your target audience with this? Our target audience is anybody who's interested in art. We're trying to do two things at once. One of the great pleasures is to have people come through our galleries. And often our galleries have been a little bit inaccessible. Gone are just the galleries that are on ground floors with big shop windows. Galleries are found on the third floor, second floor, strange lifts, up and down, down corridors. People work in, in many, many different ways. And we wanted to make those spaces accessible. We also wanted to just be there to be a, a source of information and so that people can come and look and learn. It's a wonderful thing to go into a, a dealer's uh, and see 10, 12, 15, 20 works of art, not in a crush in a museum, um, but just those works of art yourselves up close and personal where you can discuss them and be talked to about them by the owner of the gallery who knows so much about what he's showing. Um, so we are now because of COVID, we, we, we can't have people in the galleries in the same way, we're still now picking up. We went online as well and we have an online platform so that side by side to the marvellous experience of seeing the works themselves, you have this online presence with talks and you can see all the marvellous images of things that are on sale and on view. And the two things side by side offer an educational scholarly platform and indeed enticements for people who want to buy. 
What excites you the most in this winter edition? Well, it's the variety. Um, if you like works on paper, you've got marvellous exhibitions at Stephen Ongpin, you've got exhibitions Sickert and the Theatre of Life at Piano Nobile. If you want to see an exhibition uh, just about a city, you've got Naples at Colnaghi, you've got marvellous silver and goldsmith work at Koopman, rare art. You've got old master paintings, English paintings at Sotheby's, at Lowell Libson. You've got so, at Christie's, you've got so many different things that you can go and look at. You can organise a trail for yourself and decide what are the things that you're completely interested in and then take the map. We have a, a map, uh, a leaflet with a map which is online and you can work out a route for yourself and decide exactly what it is that you're going to go and view so you can really tailor make your experience and that is what to me is the most exciting thing this collegiate way of behaving by the dealers offering working together to offer this this experience and the winter event also has a symposium we've been doing this now for three years the first one was live at the national gallery and such was the success it was about collecting um, such was the success. We did one last year online about Rembrandt and this year it's about Jewish country uh, homes. Uh, it's a project with the, the History Department of Oxford University. And so we always try and present a symposium that is didactic, if you like, informative, academic, with, with a dealer's slant as opposed to just a piece of history. It's slightly always with a dealer's slant on things. Alex, what strikes my attention with uh, this event is that the scope is really big. I mean, you are saying in your press release that it's the best paintings, drawings, sculpture and objects available on the market dating from antiquity to the 21st century. So don't you yes. think maybe, I mean, this is very ambitious, of course, but maybe sometimes too ambitious to just stand out in a city like London full of very lively and exciting art events all year round? Yes, it is ambitious. And it was ambitious 20 years ago when it started just with the drawings people and then the sculpture people and the paintings people. It is ambitious, but we have to keep reminding people that the art market is alive and vibrant and made up of completely different ways of approaching it. You've got, as I say, you have auction houses which are marvellous at, uh, at offering art. You have art fairs which have got bigger and bigger and, and more and more. Um, but the dealers are the heart, the beating heart, of Mayfair and St. James. And we wanted to keep reminding people that we're there. We're there, we're good at what we do, people know what they're talking about, they offer really interesting things, as you've seen with the Ag News Discovery. Discoveries are the life stuff of art dealers, but also just how you explain things, how you can present things, the time we can take with people if they take the trouble to come and visit. So that's what the whole purpose of this is. We make no bones, it is ambitious. It's ambitious online as well, we've had to adapt. Um, but we do have big ambitions to keep to keep the art world and the art trade alive in London, in the heart of London, because it's an important part of the city that we love. OK, well, uh, very briefly before we wrap up, could you please talk us through the importance of the rediscovered Dürer artwork? Well, I am not from Agnews and I would therefore hesitate to, uh, to explain it too much. But the importance of it is that it, it was a discovery. It has been checked. All, all the research has been done. The paper, which is so important in a, in a work on paper, is checking the paper and the watermark of the paper. It's been studied and it has been confirmed as being an important drawing by the curator of uh, the Albertina Museum in Vienna. And indeed, it's going to be in the Castel of Raisonne. And to see something that has been unearthed like that um, is really very important in history of art. So the people that you should be speaking to, and I hope your visitors and your, your viewers will go and speak to the people at Ag News, to the director of Ag News, and they will tell you and talk you through it beautifully and, and go and see it. The most important thing is go and see it if you can. But if not, go online and read all about it. All right, Alexandra Toscano, it was lovely having you with us today. Thanks a lot. And thank you very much for having us. Brian Adams is best known as a musician, but he's also an accomplished photographer. And for his latest project, he got to combine both his passions. This is not Brian Adams' latest music video. It's a promotional clip for Pirelli's 2022 calendar. For this edition, 
Adams was behind the camera and his models were fellow music stars. A musical photographer, so you can't go wrong. I was like, I didn't even realize you were a photographer. I didn't know you as a musician. He said, how would you know that? But so now I'm a fan in more ways than one. He was just really open and he received any ideas that I had and made me feel comfortable. Adams didn't completely abandon the mic though. He made a song called On The Road, specifically for this project. On the road, on the road. Adam says the whole thing is a look at the life of a touring musician. And since last year, that's been widely interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. It's also the same reason why Adams couldn't attend the calendar's launch event as he tested positive. We've called this calendar on the road because we couldn't go on the road for the last two years. I, I just did my first shows last week. Yeah. Um, and it felt great to be back doing it again. Adams adds a photograph can't capture everything that goes on during tours, but he tried to create a fantastical representation of it. And now that he's wrapped up the project, he and his fellow musicians can hit the road once again. Young Iraqi artists are painting walls and streets in Baghdad. This isn't a protest. Instead, it is a means to add some color to their city. We chose popular neighborhoods because these are also historical areas that are neglected. Houses are damaged, nobody gives attention to these areas. But when we came to paint these areas, the media came as well. Many came. The area used to be historic, but with the passage of time, it got neglected. These guys painted the traditional windows, painted famous and big personalities from Kadimiya. They brought back the soul and life to this area that now caught the attention of people. Now more people come. The youth, they come to take pictures, have fun. Families come here to look at the beautiful paintings. The Royal Shakespeare Company has announced that Sir Anthony Cher has died of cancer at the age of 72. Cher played almost all of Shakespeare's most famous roles, from Richard III to King Lear. He won two Laurence Olivier Awards and was knighted in 2000. Alim Khan's After Love has swept the 2021 British Independent Film Awards, winning six prizes, including Best British Independent Film. Khan won for Best Director, Best Debut Director and Best Screenplay. Best Actress went to Joanna Scanlon and Talit Aris nabbed Best Supporting Actor. The awards have been handed out at the International Red Crescent Amity Film Festival. Best film went to That Locked Out. It's by Iranian director Amir Karami. The movie is about a nurse and a dying soldier. Sylvester Stallone has opened an art retrospective in Germany. Titled Sylvester Stallone, The Magic of Being, the exhibition features Stallone's work from late 1960s until today. The action movie star has previously exhibited his work in Russia and France. Banksy has pledged over $13 million to stop housing developers from buying a prison building in the UK. 
The Reading prison once held Oscar Wilde and Banksy wants it turned into an art center. To fund the buyout, Banksy is selling a stencil he used on the prison, which depicts Oscar Wilde escaping. A long-awaited renovation of the Met's modern art wing is about to get underway. Budget constraints put the project on hold until museum trustees Oscar Tang and Agnes Shu Tang gave the organization a $125 million donation, the largest in the museum's history. The Met is saying thank you by naming the renovated wing after them. Critics love asking if Hollywood has run out of ideas. When looking at the newest Ghostbusters film, the BBC wondered if nostalgia is killing cinema. Chris Columbus said in an interview that there is no point in remaking Home Alone. And Vanity Fair gave a backhanded compliment, saying Netflix's Cowboy Bebop is the rare remake that works. Well, Ali Jan is here to argue that there is more substance to remakes than what critics will give credit for. It's all understandable. The remakes of such hit originals like Halloween, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Dumbo, even Aladdin, all have been criticized by both fans and the press for lacking either the originality of their predecessors or character development. But there are also those remakes that justify their existence. If they're bringing, you know, something new to the game, this could be a fresh political commentary or an artistic statement, if you will. Then these movies kind of give a new meaning to these original films. A great example of uh, this kind of remake is uh, Gus Van Sant's 1998 version of Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. It's a shot-by-shot -shot remake of Hitchcock's film. But the thing is, though, at the time, you know, fans protested like, oh, like, how dare he, you know, what's the point? But I actually think it's one of the greatest experiments made in the history of cinema. What uh, Gus Van Sant wanted to do was, you know, show the world how Alfred Hitchcock's film language in Psycho from almost four decades earlier, was not only ahead of its time, but also that film language was still relevant in modern, you know, movie storytelling. And if you ask me, we don't have that many, you know, artistically courageous remakes in film, actually. Also, there is the front page, a film that has been made eight different times, but um, it's Howard Hawks's version called uh, His Girl Friday that is very important because it actually challenges uh, gender representation. Now, the original front page was this movie, you know, set in this all-male newsroom atmosphere. And what Howard Hawks did was he basically changed the co-lead into a woman. So Rosalind Russell in, you know, His Girl Friday still is working in this old card male, uh, you know, newsroom environment, but she is someone who can stand up for herself. She can uh, voice her own opinion. So this film is actually important in that we get to see the modern woman in the office space in a participating manner. It's important to remember that Hawks did this back in 1940, so he was way ahead of his time doing this. These examples are kind of like the diamond in the rough in the realm of remakes. But the thing is, they come to show that if there is a vision behind the makings of them and they're not out to make a quick buck, then actually they can distinguish themselves from their ancestry and they can actually stand on their own artistic merit as examples of uh, great and meaningful cinematic storytelling. Until next time, I'm Eljan Pamir. The Grand Hermitage Museum is probably the top go-to spot for tourists visiting St. Petersburg. But some are also looking for a more alternative art experience. And that's why they go to this plastic factory. This art museum asks its visitors to wear protective clothing before entering. Why? Well, because the space is also a functioning plastics factory.
It's a giant site, and back in 2012, one of its abandoned workshops hosted a graffiti party. Since then, it's become a new home for St. Petersburg's street art. And both locals and tourists are showing great interest. I'm very surprised that two types of activity are demonstrated here, art and engineering, and that people from different areas could unite to make something interesting, both for people with a technical mindset and creative one. This is very amazing for me. I decided to see something extraordinary, not just cathedrals and museums. I searched for unusual places in St. Petersburg, and the Internet recommended me this place. The museum has both permanent and temporary exhibitions, as well as docents. And as long as the tours are outdoors, it's much easier to explore. But once visitors head indoors, it can get a bit crowded for the factory workers. They're not complaining, though. I never thought about it too much, to be honest. But it's much more beautiful than looking at ordinary walls. Some pictures are really interesting. When artists started to come for festivals, they had such great paintings. And some of them were inside the factory. I like it. They're really good ones. And the factory's owners are also pleased, because even though people come to see the street art, the growing interest in the place is not bad for business. With its latest exhibition, Artar is celebrating a Turkish ceramicist, John Dayar Furtun's life's work. Covering 60 years of political upheavals, different art movements, philosophical questions and lots of ceramic bodies. Nursen Atutar attended the retrospective opening and she has more. After studying different types of clay for years, John Der Furtun decided to make art with it in the 1960s. She exclusively produced ceramics and never sold any of her works. Now, Istanbul's Art and Museum is holding a retrospective exhibition. Two floors of works span six decades. In the 1960s and 70s, her works include things like a ceramic teapot set. But in the 1980s, Fulton started making fragmented human bodies. Loose limbs without definition. The change in her style is linked to Turkey's coup d'etat in 1980. Jandar Furtun forms groups of bodies and body parts out of clay. Each one looks alone, but they're together nonetheless. The bodies on the walls give off a sense of warmth. And here, you can almost hear the applause. The message of community is palpable. Furtun said that we can only heal if we stick together as a community. And the sense of unity is very prominent in each gallery room. For the exhibition's curator, Selen Ansan, this is an evolution of the artist's work. John Dear Furtun, who has installed her studio in the 60s in Shishli without moving from it, really, and who has witnessed her time in the studio with her works, um, has also taken life and put it in her works. And I think this porosity, this permeability of her works, of her approach uh, with life, has been very decisive in this transition between uh, abstraction and figuration. Ansan also says that the theme of the exhibition, Shell, represents the wall between the individual and the community. She also tells us that, you know, community is not a given thing. It's something you have to build. Although Ansan says Furtun's work doesn't explain how to build a community. Instead, it's meant to stimulate conversation. She doesn't give us an answer about how to build a community or to be together. I think she presents us with the struggles of the individuals to 
be together, each one and together. Although Ansen said the artist was only asking questions on how to become a community without losing the uniqueness of the individual, she and the other organizers of the exhibition said they wished this shell that they exhibit would lead to a social healing. Nur Senat Tar Tiati World, Istanbul. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.